Hello. Let me introduce myself first. I am Nanako Nakajima. I'm dance researcher and dance dramaturg based in Kyoto, Japan. I'm very pleased to give a talk on the program Dance and Age in the framework of the Tempus Fujit project. So let me share the screen. Waking up the dance dramaturgy of aging. Dance is an art form that is particularly concerned with age. That is, to discuss aging in Euro-American dance culture is a provocation. In most Euro-American theatrical dance forms, a performer is considered old at 35 and generally finished after the early 40s. Except in rare cases, dancing into 160s is unheard of in the field. In Japanese contexts, professional dancers continue dancing into their 60s and 70s. Traditional dancers are respected and sometimes designated as intangible national assets. The long careers of contemporary Japanese dancers, such as 103-year-old Buto dancer Kazuo Ono and 73-year-old Prima Ballerina Yoko Morishita, have been widely celebrated, and their embodied bodily knowledge is more powerful than is than what is visible on stage. The historical past appears through the present aging body on stage. The recent trend in contemporary dance and performance has been influenced by the inter international debut of Kazuo Ono. For example, German choreographer, director Pina Bausch and French choreographer, dancer Jerome Bell create an atmosphere that highlights the longer lives of dancers. Along with global population aging, people have started paying more attention to this previously invisible part of dancers' lives. In 2019, in Beijing, Meng Fang Wan and I collaborated in working with the movement quality and body memories of two retired ballet dancers. Emerging director and choreographer Meng Fang Wang based in Beijing, has worked with diverse bodies of performers. And she is working with two retired ballet dancers, Kao Zigwan in his 80s and Liu Guilin in her 50s. In this lecture, I explore how intercultural dance dramaturgies of aging negotiate age cultures through three cases of aging dancers namely Kazuo Ono in context of Buto and Mas Cunningham in context of postmodern dance and Meng Fan Wan's retired ballet dancers. So I go to the first chapter. Kazuo Ono in context of Buto. In 1995, Japanese dance critic Miyabi Ichikawa described aging dancer Kazuo Ono as follows. So you see this quote in the PowerPoint. If we take a look at the word dancing, we probably find no dancer who is still professionally dancing at the age of 88, except Kazuo Ono. In Japan, there are only a few dancers around his age. Han Takehara and Yachio Inoue are old Nihonbuyo dancers. However, they live in the world of traditional Japanese dance and are respected as the eldest in the dance family school gerontocracy. They only dance a limited number of classic repertoires. In contrast, Kazuo Ono dances his new creations. Unlike them, he is neither a living national treasure, nor does he receive any honorary hours designated by the Japanese government. He is a dancer without any crown. 
end quote. Miyabi Ichikawa simply summarizes Kazuo Ono's stance. Ichikawa mentions that aging dancers in the field of dance in Japan are common. In the case of Han Takehara and Yachio Inoue, the gerontocratic family structure in Japanese culture supports this cultural value as traditional Japanese. However, in the case of Kazuo Ono, the situation is different as he receives less respect than these aging Japanese dancers. Ichikawa writes that the reason for this, res for this respect does not come from Kazuo Ono himself, but from dance critics and journalists in Japan. Japanese dance critics have long displayed a prejudice against Buto, and according to them, Buto was ugly, violent, and even a national shame for Japan. Buto dancers were outsiders in Japanese dance criticism for a considerable time. Kazuo Ono is not ashamed of showing his aging body as a dancer. Even in a wheelchair, he dances proudly in front of the audience like you see in this photo on stage. He was dancing while he was sitting on the chair. Although he follows aging dancers in the traditional Japanese dance, his global popularity is what makes him different from others. Kazuo Ono was the first aging dancer from Japan who went beyond the national boundary and was also hugely successful outside of Japan. No Japanese dancer had achieved huge success before Kazuo Ono, who propagated Buto in Europe, the US, Canada, and Latin America. Even the legendary founder of Buto, Tatsumi Hijikata, never performed outside of Japan. In addition, Tatsumi Hijikata died in 1986 before he could reach old age at the age of 57. You can see Tatsumi Hijikata in the second from the left side. He was helping Kazuo Ono's costume. Tatsumi Hijikata died in 1986. And with Kazuo Ono's aging body in dance, the aging aesthetics in Japanese dance was internationally recognized under the name of Buto. These are photos of Kazuo Ono dancing in the costumes and also in his uh, everyday clothes. The activities of Kazuo Ono blur the Buto context, and he is regarded as one of the founders of this type of dance. Kazuo Ono inspired Tatsumi Hijikata before they danced together and established his modern dance studio in 1949. 10 years before Hijikata Tazumi premiered Kinjiki, the first piece of Buto. However, Kazuo Ono came to represent Buto movement after his success in 1980 in France. How one locates Kazuo Ono's own activities in dance history is crucial to contextualize Buto within and without Japan. Moreover, this contextualization requires an intercultural perspective in the time of globalization. In a way similar to Kazuo Ono's performances, viewers are required to intertwine the Japanese context with that of world beyond Japan. So here, I show the excerpt from the film by Daniel Schmidt. And this film is called as Kazuo Ono. And it was uh, shot in 1995.
the videos of Kazuo Ono performing. So he was first uh, dancing in the Yokohama Harbor. And then uh, at the end of the video excerpt, he was dancing at his home uh, in Yokohama. So his wife, Kazuo Ono's wife, was cooking, standing behind him. And he was dancing in his everyday clothes. So this is Yoshito Ono holding the puppet of his father, Kazuo Ono. And it was uh, at the same dance studio in Yokohama. Kazuo Ono has, a, has his own dance studio uh, next to his own house in Yokohama. And this photo was taken at the dance studio. Kazuo Ono's son, Yoshito Ono, is the main figure of the Buto movement and performed the piece Kinjiki with Tatsumi Hijikata in 1959, which marked the beginning of the Buto movement. Yoshito Ono also plays the role of storyteller for Kazuo Ono by interpreting his artistic language and figure. Yoshito Ono explains how Kazuo Ono's movement quality is explored during his creative process. So you can see his movements don't consist of a series of consecutive actions in time. They don't simply follow one another in a linear sequence. Instead, one has the impression that he thrusts deeper and deeper into each and every movement and step, as though he were moving within each movement. His performances generate the feeling of being drawn from a great depth in himself. By comparison, when most dancers perform any given movement, it tends to stop dead at a certain point. Kazuo Ono pursues his deep self in his movement by writing down his words on paper. Kazuo Ono's movement thus consists of his words, which do not produce visible body forms. For Kazuo Ono, a dance technique produces visible consecutive forms in a linear sequence. Therefore, it does not go beyond the boundary of the visible dancer's body, whose technique is confined within this visible world. Instead, Kazuo Ono dives deep into his own words to transform his visible body into his invisible world and its inner self within an alternative temporality. The process of aging helps him transcend his visible, limited, deteriorating body. Even in this physically diminished state, Kazuo Ono has remained free alive. As the divide between life and death starts drawing in, the intensity of these warning moments has generated a lyricism and fragrance hitherto unknown in his work. At over 90 years of age, when most dancers have long abandoned their careers, the strength of his dance emerges even more forcefully despite his body progressively weakening. So I move to the second chapter, two, Mars Cunningham in context of postmodern dance. In 1985, US theater director and performance studies scholar, Richard Schechner wrote about seniority in performers intercultural training. He found that in Asia, senior artists have earned the right to make changes in the tradition. And these changes are regarded as the high points of an artistic career. They are what gives both the individual and the tradition a sense of personal expression. In the US, it is the opposite. He also writes, 
the Euro-American obsession with the new has degraded creative life, relegating senior artists to a kind of limbo, honored but unemployed. In other words, senior artists have no right to exist. Dance scholar Lamsey Burt points out that US postmodern dance artists diversified the notion of dance and invited the topic of older dancers in dance discourse. Since the 1960s, they have explored the new form of dance and they have kept working until recently reaching old age. These were members of the Jadoson Dance Theater and brought about the aesthetic revolution in the 1960s, expanding the performance options for all the dancers. Quote, Tricia Brown, Simone Folti, Deborah Hay, Steve Paxton, and Yvonne Rayner, all of whom were associated with Jadoson Dance Theater in the 1960s have all gone on dancing into their 60s or 70s, end quote. While the Jadison members initially worked collectively as Jadison Dance Theatre and the Grand Union, they eventually pursued their individual forms of dance and performance. In contrast to many of the Jadison artists, Mas Cunningham, was both a dancer and an innovative choreographer who appreciated technically trained dancers. So this is Mars Cunningham teaching his dancers. Cunningham first studied with Martha Graham and later founded his dance company to continue dance experiments. While Cunningham can have continued dancing into his 70s, he himself choreographed his younger, highly trained dancers. What made him stand out from others is that he kept dancing as well as choreographing others into his old age. This enabled him to change his previous choreography, which he had had to adjust to his aging body. In contrast to Kazuo Ono, who mostly improvised his solo dance by himself and did not choreograph other dancers, Cunningham was in the position of dancer and choreographer in the dance company system. Along with aging, Cunningham struggled with working with working as a dancer. As he became older and his company expanded, his work as choreographer increased and his direct communication with dancers decreased. While he used to spend time with his dancers as if they were part of his family, they were much younger when Cunningham reached the age of 50. From the 1970s to the early 1980s, Cunningham struggled with a discrepancy between him as a dancer and as choreographer. In addition to aging, it was more and more difficult for him to dance together with other dancers because he had to spend more time watching them and answering questions. In 1980, Cunningham had knee surgery and arthritis forced him to retire from the stage. US dance historian Mark Franco writes about Cunningham's final solo for himself, Roops, which became a motion captured digitized version by the artist group Open Ended Group in 2001 to 2011. This choreography was originally created by Cunningham in 1971 for various systems of his body. There was a loop system for his head, for his torso, for his legs, and for his arms and hands. 
this digitized versions of loops was created as the three-dimensional form of the movement of Cunningham's hands on film. In the late 1990s, when Cunningham was old, already an old man, whenever he did go on stage, he only performed loops with his hands. Paul Kaiser of the Open-Ended Group explains that this is a piece that no one else could perform because with the sense of time that Cunningham has, he could do more things simultaneously with the articulation of his hands and fingers than anyone else could. Loops is a different kind of choreography than what he created for his company's dances. In loops, where 10 movements are happening at once, one cannot perform them by thinking them through on a given beat. Instead, one must skip all that somehow and simply do them in the interval one has given oneself. According to Cunningham, this choreography is not teachable. So I show three photos here. Uh, the one on the top is actually the different piece called Piped in 1999. And this work is, was in collaboration with Cunningham and the open-ended group using motion capture technology. So uh, Cunningham's dancers were dancing together with this uh, digitized image. And the second photo is Mars Cunningham himself uh, attached to the motion captured uh, sensor. And the third one on the bottom is the photo from Loops. So I show you this uh, digitized versions of uh, Loops by the open-ended group and Cunningham. February 20th, 1937, Saturday, four hour train trip, 1.30 to 5.30. Taxi ride from Macy's 36th Street up to 50th Street through my first glimpse of the Great White Way. Taft. Victoria filled up, finally park at Hotel Chesterfield, dump of the first water. in something to marvel at, a bit of the Austrian Tyrol, translated to the center theater. Wonder what the backstage is like. Minsky certainly proves a lot. Burlesque, a lot of trouble.
February 21st, 1937, Sunday, 11 o'clock High Mass at St. Patrick's, Sermon on the Defense of Religion, my breakfast at the Ottoman was interesting as well as edible. The afternoon spent browsing through the Metro Art Museum, Reynolds, Rembrandt, Rubens, Van Dyck, Titian, all have their play. Books uh, that you have just watched, um, Mark Franco writes, as if Cunningham's whole aging body devolves into his hands. The outcome of groups as a motion capture film enlarges the transferential quality of Cunningham's gestures in that his hands as performers disappear as such. In other terms, it is a defiguration of the hands that ultimately speaks to this disability of the modernist gesture itself once it has become unmoored from the moral and ethical criteria of craft, handiwork, dancer's body, aging body, and disabled body, and finally lent itself to the instrumentalizations of the medium as such. Not only Cunningham de derogated the movement of his whole aging body to his hands, but he himself modified his original choreography into one for his hands. No one else but him can perform all the loops, including the one for the hands. For Cunningham, this is the piece for him to dance and choreograph eternally. So I move to the final part, uh, chapter three. three. Waking Up the Aging Revolutionary Ballet Dancers. In 2019, director and choreographer Meng Fang Wan and I collaborated on the piece, When My Cue Comes, Call Me and I Will Answer, in Beijing, with the aim to work with the movement quality and body memories of two retired ballet dancers. This project explores the dramaturgy of aging in When My Cue Comes as a tool to legitimize aging ballet dancers in dance aesthetics. First, I reflect on the history of ballet in China with particular attention to the embedded ideologies during the Cultural Revolution and the subsequent transformation of dance aesthetics in China away from pro-aging values. Then I demonstrate how this complex history manifests through the bodies of two aging dancers in When My Cue Comes, Call Me and I Will Answer, and how Wang uses various concepts to highlight these dancers. And this is Men Fan Wan, and this piece, When My Cue Comes, uh, is directed and choreographed by Meng Fan Wan and premiered at Woodson Theatre Festival in 2019 and then presented in Beijing at Inside Out Theatre. And in 2020, it was presented again in Shanghai at the Ming Contemporary Art Museum. 
and still continued the tour. The history of dance aesthetics in China is complicated. Ballet, which was initially introduced to China as a communist ideal by Russia, was localized during the Cultural Revolutions from 1966 to 1976. In those days, European ballet repertoires were forbidden from being performed because they were too foreign. Instead, national ballet companies only performed revolutionary ballet based on Chinese regents reformed by Xian Xin, also known as Madame Mao. These shows combined ballet techniques with Chinese folk dance and classical Chinese operas. Ballet was introduced to China with the intention of modernizing Chinese dance. Revolutionary ballet served as a medium to promote socialist ideologies, such as the class struggle between landowners and tenants in White Haired Girl, premiered in 1965. And you can see the photo of White Haired Girl and the positive heroic main character in Red Detachment of Women premiered in 1964. In these revolutionary ballets, the bodies of female ballet dancers became the battleground of the communist revolution and women's liberation. The revolutionary ballet was used as propaganda during the Cultural Revolution, which is considered a historical failure by the current communist party. Since communism in China is related to the idea of modernism, it follows that the revolutionary ballet dancers symbolize the ideal modern Chinese person. Here, the transformation of aging ideals in Chinese dance aesthetics is of particular interest. As a result of this modernization, the ancient pro-aging philosophy disappeared from ballet. This disappearance is exemplified in the case of a revolutionary ballet repertoire called White Haired Girl, in which the protagonist's hair becomes white, but she remains a young woman in China. In Asia, uh, here's a black, mostly, and when we get older, it becomes white. In contrast, the protagonist of Matsuyama Ballet Company of Japan's rendition, where this story was originally adapted from the film to the ballet format before being performed in China, was still performed by 73-year-old prima ballerina, Yoko Morishita. And thus, the pro-aging philosophy is embraced in her performance of the eponymous white-haired, ageless hermit woman, Hakumo Senjo. While the repertoire of modernized ballet becomes different in China and Japan, the new approach toward aging revolutionary ballet comes from the younger generation. Men Fan Wan, an emerging theater dance artist based in Beijing, has worked with diverse performers. She worked with children in her previous piece, The Divine Sewing Machine, which expands on the idea of aging by growing older. In this piece, When My Q Comes, we explore aging in another context. The movement quality and body memories of two retired ballet dancers from the National Ballet of China. Kao Zigwan, aged 81, and Liu Guilin, aged 59. And you can see both of them in these photos. In this performance, Wang explores the historical concept of the modernist dancing body in China as depicted through the aging bodies of the two dancers. The dancers' bodies are formed by ballet technique 
which does not allow their bodies to be fragile and aged. This bodily sensation dictates their mind and betrays their bodies when they want to dance like before. Although traces of revolutionary ballet can no longer be detected in these dancers' movements, in their memory, the haunted past appeared as Giselle, a romantic ballet that was forbidden from being performed during the Cultural Revolution. You can see the photo and the other two are stage photos from this piece. Giselle was their favorite and forbidden repertoire brought to us during the rehearsal process, which was incorporated as source material to this piece. As a result, we worked to revive the spirit of ballet among the aging modernist dancers in China. To reveal the beauty and talent of their dancing, informed by the balletic past of the dancers, Wang tasked the aging dancers with reconnecting their bodies and mind through the Alexander technique and Feldenkrais method. In the early rehearsal days, Wang and her assistant choreographer practiced the Alexander technique to help these dancers feel the bodies from different perspectives. While Mr. Kao was sitting, they used their hands and their warmth to give him a right massage to release the tension in his muscle and put all his weight on his feet. At the end, they led Mr. Kao to stand up with eyes closed and finished with a warm hug. The whole process took 40 minutes and they exchanged energy. When Wang's assistant released her arms and asked Mr. Kao to open his eyes, there were tears coming out of his eyes and all of them could not stop weeping. In this production, Wang has been looking for a kind of movement quality that could only be reached by ballet dancers based on their body memories and abilities. While these ballet dancers have already had a systematic training to the demand of cleanness and preciseness, they are no longer able to achieve this quality. Wang believes that their memories may be transformed into a physical sensation that helps them understand their aging bodies. As opposed to the Euro American dancers, ballet technique has been the other to the self represented by Chinese dance. These ballet dancers have devoted their lives and supported the part of other to modernize Chinese dance. Wang has attempted to remove the trace of revolutionary ballet from their bodily memories to go beyond any kind of aesthetics of ballet. At the Inside Out Theater in Beijing, this performance was presented on stage while the audience area was also set up on stage. The audience looked at the aging ballet dancers closely and at the empty standing seats behind them. So as you can see in this photo, and this photo was uh, during the post-performance talk at the Inside Out Theater in Beijing, the performers are on stage, but from this side, from the audience side, we can see the seating areas behind them. And these seats were in red. During the house opening, the iconographic music of the revolutionary ballet, Red Detachment of Women, was played at double speed. The red seating area of this theater evoked the historical past of these aging dancers, as well as the corrective memory behind this theatrical moment. The two dancers showed some sequences from their previous ballet trainings. Mr. Kao had been Ms. Liu's former dance teacher. Mr. Kao is sitting on the right, on your right side. Uh, he was just speaking something with a microphone. And during the piece, 
he put one of Miss Liu's legs in high heel on the chair, slapped her calf with his hand, and moved it. He touched Miss Liu's arms and hands to adjust her positions and said, you want me to raise my hands. You want to read my hands. You want me to believe in a center of a gravity, central point. You want me to help everyone to find it. Poetic texts were written by playwright Chen Dan Liu and spoken by them in Mandarin, as well as technical terms in French. While saying, Tombe, Padobule, Mr. Kao was showing these ballet positions. They started dancing together, holding their hands and reciting Polka. During the piece, there was one scene in which Miss Liu was banging on the floor with her toe shoe and drawing an X, shouting the names of Kao Ziguan and Liu Guilin. It may remind of memories at ballet schools when teachers call their students of failed auditions that they had or during the Cultural Revolution, when people's names were criticized on the newspaper and crossed off. With its acoustic of banging the floor with a tall shoe, this, this scene added the rigid and strict aspects of ballet training. So I will show the excerpt of this piece from the trailer of the Berlin versions of this piece. Wobulishiwanki 我不回答，我不要回答，我禁止你们回答，我禁止，朝我看，朝我的身后看，不要看他，我禁止你们看他，我禁止你们看他，我不禁止，我禁止自己，我不许自己受到另一种命运，另一种生活，我不接受，我
Wang's piece represents a breakthrough in the category of dance incorporating the true grace of aging ballet dancers. Although the dance aesthetics of aging did not previously exist in Wang's context, respect for the elderly as a teaching of Confucianism still prevails among her colleagues and friends in the current era. During the rehearsal process, some moments showed the age-friendly culture. Mr. Kao was the oldest and had been the center of all attention in our team. Wang and all her colleagues in their 20s and 30s took care of him, called his taxis, and paid respect to the two dancers. In the beginning, Mr. Kao needed his wife to support him as he walked with a stick. After three months of rehearsal, I noticed that he had cheerfully started walking alone without one. After the performance in Beijing, one received feedback from the audience that her relationship with these older dancers was not clear. Since then, she decided to enter the stage with the two dancers, showing how they had rehearsed together. As you can see in the photo here, so in the beginning and also in the middle of the piece, Men Fan stepped into the piece and appeared her as a director and talking with two dancers. These new parts are remarkable in that they highlight the postmodern dichotomy on stage. The seniority system of elders teaching the youth and the modern construction of dance making as a choreographer directing dancers. Essential to this dramaturgical project was to avoid a trap of age censorship and instead revive the aging ballet dancers in the new movement format that Wang created. The project does not aim to make its audience wonder at these older dancers' ability to accomplish a normative dancing body. Instead, it seeks to reconcile the past, which is connected to the cultural revolution in China. When the age hierarchy was turned upside down, this project proposes a postmodern perspective on the ideas of bodies and communism as they relate to aging bodies in the Chinese historical context and considers how these ideals may be enacted through dance practice to resuscitate the beauty of their dancing. Wang has unveiled their dancing talent, the balletic past of the dancers, to reconnect their bodies and mind. When a ballet artist has achieved true grace, the art of the ballet thrives. Wang invites the audience to perceive historical beauty in the present by showcasing the dramaturgical framework of aging in this piece. This is proof that even in an ancient framework, the beauty of dance remains. Just as Nick Bottom wakes up from his dream in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, the audience is awakened to an unseeable and unsayable aesthetics. When your cue comes, call you and you will answer. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>